If you can 3D print something, you can make it in solid metal too. It's a bit challenging, it's a little equipment intensive, but today I'm going to show you how to make it a little bit easier. So if you want to see how to turn this into this, stick around. We're going to be following along this really cool dinosaur skull that I found on printables. I didn't make it. It's free, it's awesome, I'll, I'll put a link below. Why am I going to make this in metal? Uh, because it looks cool and literally no other reason. If that's not a good enough reason, like, what are we even doing here, right? To get the most detail and because of the shape, I'm going to investment cast this in a vacuum casting machine. Think like lost wax jewelry, same deal. I printed this in Soraya Tech cast purple resin, which is designed for this process. The resin is kind of difficult to print. It's primarily designed to burn out cleanly without like leaving any ash or gunk behind. Normal resins won't do that. Trust me on that. I tried. This resin's like full of wax and it's really difficult to print. So to make it easier, I use a Uniformation GK2 printer. I've mentioned it before, it's my favorite resin printer, hands down. I've tried this on a few different printers and the GK2 is the most reliable. I think it's because of the resin vat heater. This resin is really, really sensitive and resins in general don't print very well if it gets cold or whatever. This is especially a problem here because this is Wisconsin. The temperature fluctuates like crazy and we're out in like a really drafty garage. This isn't inside my house, obviously. I mean, okay, the inside of my house isn't a whole lot cleaner than that, but I don't have welders in the bedroom, you know? The GK2 heats the resin before it starts to like the same point. Uh, and that, that reduces failures. And by reducing failures, I mean I've only ever had one print in this resin on the GK2 that didn't come out fine. We should probably take a look at that actually. Man, it's hard to focus on something this small. This top thing here, that's not supposed to look like a little flower or whatever. That actually broke off. There was this fine, fine filigree stuff holding this top up. And uh, I, I supported this myself. This is not a pre-supported file. And I did not do auto supports. I thought I would be, you know, smart and try to do it all myself. And I apparently didn't support anything under that ring. And it just broke off. It's only being held on there by the support material that I didn't clip off yet. But get a load of some of this detail. It is, in fact, such fine detail that I can barely get it on video. And keep in mind, this is a 10 inch 8K printer. So anybody out there saying that like a 29 micron pixel is too big, is it really? And this isn't even easy to print stuff. This isn't like a high definition resin. This is a difficult resin to print. Kind of bummed because if I, if I had done that right, I definitely would have tried casting this. Not really sure you can blame the printer on this one because uh, it, was, it was supported by someone who had no idea what they were doing. Uh, but this is, to date, the only print that came out that I couldn't use with this resin on this printer. If I had anything else to show you, I would show you that. Printing is one thing, and I've talked about the printer before, but the washing and curing of this resin is... It's... It's a whole thing. The prints look fantastic, sure, but like, it's really goopy and sticky. It's got wax in it, because obviously it has to melt out and burn out. Uh, it's kind of brittle. I'm not going to show you, because I don't want to break this. Until now, I've been taking the prints and dunking them in a bucket of dirty alcohol, letting them sit there for like 5-10 minutes, and then I put them in a normal washing station, which has like the impeller in the bottom, and it makes a whirlpool of alcohol, and it just flings the prints all over the place. So they're ramming into each other, and the, the walls of the of like the basket holding it. And that's not really good when one of the key features of your resin is crazy brittleness. And even then I like have to take them out and like wash them off with water and like look, and it never gets all their goopy resin off. And it's back in the bucket and it's, it's, it's a whole thing. And that's where this comes in, the Uniformation Wash Station. This does not look like any other wash station that I've seen. And there is no impeller in there. It doesn't fling everything around. It is in fact ultrasonic. The curing station is cool too. We'll get to that in a minute. Here's something I just discovered. This ridge, check it out. It sits right on top there. That would be super handy if these prints were really tall and if I filled this thing up with uh, alcohol, but I, I did not. I only put in one jug. It's more than the minimum too. This is, this is almost four liters, but it certainly isn't seven. All right, let's see. This is tricky to do one-handed. They're barely submerged. I don't know how long to, to wash ultrasonically. Sure, 10, 10 minutes sounds good, right? Oh, it's happening. Can you see the texture change on the surface? I can. Kinda hurts my ears, if I'm honest. Let's give it some time, see how it goes. It's still wet, but that looks pretty clean. Let's check some of the other ones. This is the one I really wanted to look at because it's a freaking dinosaur skull. That looks pretty clean. If I can get it in focus, I think that's all it took. 10 minutes in, in the ultrasonic and this goopy, goopy, sticky, waxy resin is all clean. Yeah, I, I like this ultrasonic and because it's all the parts just sit there, they, they don't like whirl around. 
like the other ones, uh, I don't have like wax parts like hitting the walls and breaking, you know? That makes this probably, this is much better for cleaning the really, really fragile like blue stuff. Oh man, that looks so good. Okay, they all look good except this human skull. This one had a ton of support material on the bottom. It was sitting like this, like flat, just slightly up. And um, I took the supports off. It still looks kind of wet and resiny, like especially like up in there. Man, it's hard to focus this small. This stuff, these things are so small. You gotta zoom in so far to see any detail of this camera. So there, I mean, like the top of his head looks good. I don't see any issues there, but down underneath, the blocked by all the support material, that needs, that needs to go back in the bucket. This is how I have been curing this Soraya Tech stuff. I basically, I get a glass bowl, I line it with foil, and I put the stuff in there, like with some, some heavy stuff to hold it down under the liquid. See the liquid? That's vegetable glycerin. This is what uh, Soraya Tech says you should cure it under to keep the oxygen from the air out of there. The foil is because I want the UV that goes in there to bounce around and get up under there. And I've actually been curing it in this. This is a standard cure station, but you'll notice there's foil there. And that takes the UV that goes out of that tower there and bounces it down. So I get a lot of light going straight down in the top. That way light goes straight down there and then bounces around. See? Okay, let's use the dinosaur skull because this one looks by far the coolest. I have no other reason for this one. I removed the foil. We'll get to why in a second. Um, you basically have to sink this thing down in the, in the vegetable glycerin. This stuff, vegetable glycerin. You have to sink it down because you don't want the oxygen to touch it. So I just use, these are just pieces of plumbing solder, basically. Hook it through, I'll just hook it through the bones. There we go, sure. Solder will help it sink. Vegetable glycerin, by the way, not toxic, but it's, it's, it's sticky. Sticky and gross. Ugh. It never dries either. The reason I took out the foil is because this has lights underneath and up top and on two sides. So that means it's gonna get light from all different sides. Now, interesting thing, uh, glass will stop UVB radiation. It's less good at stopping UVA. The difference is UVB radiation is shorter wavelength. UVA is much longer. It's up to almost, you know, five, 400 nanometers. Well, this resin is designed for 405 nanometers. So like th this UV light, it's, it's borderline like long enough that it's not even ultraviolet. It's right at the edge. Like if it was any more, if it was any longer wavelength, we would just call it purple light, right? But the thing is, longer wavelength light is better at penetrating stuff. Glass stops shortwave UVB, it does not stop as well UVA, and it's really bad at stopping the 405 nanometer light we get from this. Presumably vegetable glycerin doesn't stop it at all either, otherwise why would Soraya Tech tell you to cure this purple stuff in vegetable glycerin? Right? So I don't have to do the foil line there, I don't have to do the foil line cure station like back there. I can just sit it in the, in the glass in here and cure that. And if you didn't care at all about wavelength and different types of UV radiation, uh, congratulations, uh, you've, you've learned anyway. I cared, I was curious, that's why I looked it up, like doesn't this stop UV? Well it's a different wavelength. Close that lid. I actually want you to cure it for a long time. I'm, I'm gonna go half hour, why not? Cool. I put it in there, I put it in there off-centered, and you can see my reflection in it. it. Does look cool though. With the skull being so long, with like thin sections, I'm screwing it up with multiple points for the metal to get in there. Sometimes you want that because you don't want the metal to have to like travel all the way through these long little things. But I'm mainly doing it to hold the print up. This is kind of, kind of large and the wax that I'm screwing it with, this is like jeweler's wax, it's not very tough. And if I just stuck like one big sprue on there, uh, the weight of the print would just break it right off. Don't mind all the dice, those those are for a game. Metal dice are cool. It's always good to know you can throw them at your opponent if you're really angry, and it can cause damage. There's also another ring on there, and maybe I'll finish that later. That was just an afterthought. For those of you who haven't seen my previous videos on this subject, the plaster I'm using is called Prestige Optima. It's designed for lost plastic and resin casting. Normal lost wax plaster can crack because wax just melts out, but resin actually expands before it melts out. This plaster is designed to expand a bit, and it's kind of tough. I did the mixing and the burnout process as outlined by the plaster manufacturer. I didn't use that. I just used a plaster one because it was easiest to find. The metal I'm using here is ZA12 or Zamic 12. It's not actually Zamic. It's a zinc and aluminum alloy and it's pretty awesome overall. I use it for lots of stuff. If you're in the US, the place to get it is Rotometals. Rotometals.com. This stuff is great. Like Zamic, most people die cast with it, but ZA12 is used a lot for gravity casting, gravity sand casting, which is what I do most of the time. I'm using it here for investment casting. It's it's great. You can you can use these as like personal defense weapons. It's it's really good stuff. It's really tough, tougher than aluminum. It's shiny, it's really cheap and it melts at a pretty low temperature. Think like pewter, but much tougher, and it needs a little bit more heat. Seriously, it's not steel, but it is tougher than aluminum. 
Investment casting usually needs like precise temperature control and I'm still figuring that out. I really have no idea what the right temperature is for like vacuum casting ZA12 alloy. Probably because nobody else is doing it. I think I poured when the electric furnace said the melt was like 500 Celsius and the, the mold was held after the burnout, the mold was held around 600 Fahrenheit. Yes, mixing Fahrenheit and Celsius because why make it easier on myself? That's crazy talk. One issue, since I'm doing this at a lower temperature than if you were to cast like bronze or gold or silver, uh, dunking the plaster in the water doesn't actually boil and break the plaster away. I actually had to go dig it out of there uh, in the kitchen sink, obviously. And I promise I didn't cover everything in plaster. Looks pretty cool, huh? And this is right out of the plaster. No sanding, no polishing, no cleanup. It just looks this good right away. It'd probably look even better if I didn't pour too hot. I think it was too hot, but you can't really argue with how good it looks, right? So with the cleanup, I'm not really spending a lot of time cleaning it up. I'm not putting in a whole bunch of effort. I'm just hitting, I'm just hitting one side of the skull with a Dremel polisher and the red compound that comes with a Dremel. When it comes to this cool looking, you really don't need to spend a lot of time arduously cleaning it up. It just looks pretty good. What do you think of that? Cool, right? Okay, next time I'll probably make something that has a greater purpose than just looking cool. Hopefully it also looks cool. Maybe it'll be big and sand cast. Uh, incidentally, if you want to learn sand casting using your 3D printer, there's a link for you down below. All the equipment I talked about in this video is also in the link below, the pinned comment in the description. If I were just starting to get into this investment casting thing, I would, I would get the Uniformation printer and wash cure station as a kit. They come as a kit. And then I would get the vacuum casting thing because you can gravity pour this stuff, but this kind of detail, you really need the vacuum. For these like waxy, goopy resins, even for like tough resins, some like normal plastic tough resins are really, really goopy. Especially that ultrasonic cleaner is really awesome. It makes it almost as easy as normal plastic resin. Almost, not quite though.